It was 3-1, ladies and gentlemen. But the Montreal Canadiens fought and clawed their way back. And on the other side of that, the Toronto Maple Leafs lost in that Game 7. The legacy continues for some people in good ways and bad ways. We will cover all of that today. Um, we will talk about the Leafs and that. We, this might all be the whole episode, by the way, depending on how much time we get. We might talk about Boston series, even though we haven't watched any of it because it's the air in the scheduling has been god-awful. We will talk about the Leafs, especially. We will cover the Canadians because there were two teams in this series, ladies and gentlemen. Sportsnet will not believe that, but... Where do we start, guy? How do you how do you guys feel right now? What's the feeling in the podcast? Because I, I think that Alex will be mad. I feel like Daniel is disappointed. Oh yeah, you're right. I I just I, let, let let's get there, Alex. You want to start with, with that Leafs jersey behind you? Let's start with the Leafs side of things. Mm. What happened to the Toronto Maple Leafs? Um, nothing new. <laughs> is the way i'll put it like i'm it's nothing new but i think this year i said it at the beginning of the year that if the i said i remember if it was exactly at the beginning of the year or part way through but i said if they do not win at least two rounds i think that is should be considered a failure of a season and we'll decide Mm -hmm. who to blame for that at that point they did not get past the first round again which whatever uh, uh, but they, it is a failure this season is a failure mm-hmm. that is how I feel Daniel I feel like ever since we went to 31 thoughts together I am still haunted by Chris Johnson's words that this is the greatest Leafs team that this generation has seen and is that, sorry maybe maybe I'll, yeah I'll I don't know I know in terms of the talent it's there but I don't know. Like, like you, you put it perfectly. I am disappointed. I, I did feel the stress from this game. I f- didn't know really what to think of it in terms of momentum on the Leafs side. But, yeah, I don't know. Like, like we, we'll get into it. But just like, a kind of thing with me where, like, I knew it was over when they were talking about that, okay, they have to do it a third time to get back from a two-goal deficit. And from there, I'm just like, again, this happened again. You don't want to talk about the the team being the best it's probably ever been. I mean, and people have been saying this to death. A top five scorer in the league in, all, in um, Mitch Marner. Austin Matthews with 41 goals in 52 games played. The Rocket Richard winner. William Nylander having an amazing year. Showing up in the playoffs like everyone so expected. It's amazing that... If you had told me that by the end of this series, regardless of win or lose, that everyone would be praising William Nylander of everyone on the Leafs, I would be amazed. Not because I don't have the the thing, it's Nylander. We are that group that that recognize the value of that player and the value in that contract. It's just taken this long for a lot of other people to realize it. So game seven. 550 frontline workers got into the game. That was really cool, by the way. That was really nice to see. Like the morning of, by the way. Yes. Last yes, minute yes. decision. After a, 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 so a, cla- a vintage Ontario government move <laughs> the day before saying this isn't going to happen and then changing their mind less than 24 hours later. Classic. Unfortunately, you wouldn't be able to actually know because they kept drowning the crowd out with – with the inserted chance, like, what are you doing? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure what that was. No, it was so weird. So looking first and foremost, I want to talk about the start of the game because if anything I've noticed through the first seven games, first seven games, the seven games of this series is I think Montreal always had the best start. They always came prepared for the first 20 minutes. If there was a game I was expecting Toronto to come out all guns blazing, it was going to be game seven. And the Habs were expecting it too. And it just, it didn't happen. That's what shocks me the most about game seven is there was the 
And we see this all the time. Any game seven, any start to a game, the home team is there and it's expected they're they're going to come out blazing, hitting, trying to get the scoring chances, going hard to the net. And we just didn't see that from Toronto. And I don't I don't get how that doesn't happen. Neither like here's my take. I am partially surprised and I am partially not surprised. Mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, the core you can you can say tinker around they tinkered around the edges, which they did. At the end of the day, this is the same core. The same core from 2017. And uh, like I'm thinking back on it. The best year for me was 2017 because my expectations were low. Since then, it's just been utter whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's been the same way where the excuse has always been, we don't start on time. We don't start on time. We don't start on time. And it's never changed. So to me, that doesn't come as a surprise. And But at the same time, you, we were told, and fans clamored for this as well, you need to add the certain guys. And I'm sorry, you can use 2020 hindsight, but when the moves were made, I don't think many people were complaining with the exception of Joe Thornton because he's 42 years old. But in terms of the leadership that was added, I think a lot of people now are are using 2020 hindsight a little too much. Um, but it doesn't seem like that helped with the important pieces of this team. You know, I think a lot of people, especially once John Tavares went down, were like, okay, this is when Thornton, yeah, a lot of people will now say, oh, why'd you get Joe Thornton? It's like, not like the Sharks won anything. Like, that's not the point. He was the fun grandpa. They can only do so much. It is the, but at the, at the end of the day, those top guys need to show up. And I'm assuming you have the leaf scoring totals of the playoffs in front of you, Alex, right? Yeah. Before we go into all of those, and I think we got to talk about this guy right away. In his last 12 playoff games, Mitch Marner does not have a goal. 18. Oh, my gosh. 18. He does 18 games. He does not have a five on five goal. 18, is it? Is it? Oh, okay. Oh, man. That's, That's not still good. bad. That's bad. Not good. Yeah. Sir, I just I looked at the NHL score sheets and I saw, okay, so in 1920 and 2021, there were zero. I saw he had two in 1819, but bad. I'm guessing those must have been at the start of the series. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. In fact, in 32 career playoff games, he has five goals. How many points does he have? Uh, 25 and 32. So it's uh, 20 assists. Which, like, so... We're going to get to Deneau later. What I really looked in the series and saw what eventually I got, I was sick of the line matching anyway, right? But as it went on, you saw how effective Phil Deneau was in shutting down Austin Matthews. I would see through that, and that would give more room to Mitch Marner. When it feels like the only player on that line who actually took advantage of that room was Zach Hyman. And we saw that in game seven, Hyman had that great look in front, but Carey Price stopped him. In fact, I think that's happened at least once every game this series, but like the miss at the end of the first period, I thought Marner was going to bury that and that was going to be it for the game. I was terrified, but he misses the net. But that Hyman, what you said about Hyman, does that surprise anyone here? Uh, Hyman himself? No. The fact that Mitch couldn't capitalize in it is a surprise. No, but supremely disappointing. It's very disappointing. Uh, all around. I don't know if you want to get into Mitch right now. We can, but I'll just say this. Mitch Marner is tied in points in seven games with Alex Galchenyuk. Alex Galchenyuk. Mm -hmm. They both have four points. (laughs) Don't don't bring in the cap hits, Daniel. Please don't. We're going (laughs) to (laughs) do I asked Alex this before the show, Daniel, and and uh, so I want I want to get your take on this. This may be completely crazy, but is Mitch Marner like Johnny Goudreau? Is he this wicked regular season guy who can well the speed, the offensive talent, but when the playoffs just come around, he sucks. Ah, uh, yeah. Or am I being too hard? Um. 
I mean, you know, it's not like you're like comparing him to like a bottom six guy. I think that is a very accurate comparable, but I think it's just based on the way the organizations are respectively. Marner in a way is a bit, I think he's a bit safe to a certain degree, just based on the fact that, I don't know. It just, we ha- they have all these other guys there. I think for Calgary, it's just, there is just that overall disappointment, especially the way this season went. But I could see what you're 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 going with that. Like when it comes to Marner, it just and I don't know. I I I feel like I'm doing this too often, but I'm making the NBA comparable again, mm-hmm. where we get another Demar Derozan type of player. Where I saw that know, comparison. Yeah, beloved guy. You know he'll put up the points for you in the regular season, but you know when you put him in the playoffs or you put him in front of like tougher competition. It, it just goes away. It's just, it's just not there. It's not the same fa- X factor or anything. And I'm not saying you trade him, but I'm like, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing that 2019 Raptors comparison right now, but the way I, I kind of see it is that, like, you really have to elevate your game. I think a, a big thing that I gave to Marner the last few years is that he's young, that he's developing and, you know, it's it's just the way things are going to be. But there has to be a certain point now, especially with the leaders you've given him, who could show him the way. You know, I think it's it's a bit inexcusable. But again, I'm looking at the other side too. Like maybe there's that mental factor to it too, because a lot of those miscues he's had, the penalties or even the shots he's been missing, especially when they're like perfect passes. I think there's just something something off. Mm-hmm. Uh, Two things. Number one, I'm not even. I, I don't want to entertain the idea of comparing this team to the Toronto Raptors, 2018 or 19 Toronto Raptors, because that is disrespectful to the Toronto Raptors. They won playoff rounds. Like, there's no comparison here. This is un. This is unprecedented. What the what they that this team has managed to do at least they were going up against the best player in the world in LeBron James. And that's what was stopping them was LeBron James. Why? Like they're who like I, I get Boston and I fully understand that. And there there's the perfection line there, but like they haven't even won a playoff round. Uh, and number two with, with Mitch Marner, he has put this on himself. When he signed ten po- for that ten point eight nine three uh, million dollar contract, he put this on himself. I, and and let me be clear, I'm not saying I, I don't want to attack Mitch Marner personally because that's not fair, and that's not what I'm trying to do. But when you have, when you put up a performance like that for two years in a row, that is unacceptable in so many ways that it's we're getting to a point where I talked about Nazem Kadri and I said he needs to be traded because two years in a row he put this team in jeopardy by being suspended Mitch Marner two years in a row disappeared in the playoffs I don't care away from his quotes if he thought they got scoring chances. That line was Man. not even close to the best line on this team. The the line that the Kerfoot Nylander line once Tavares got injured was the best line. The whatever line Jason Spezza was on was the second best line, and then maybe this one. And it wasn't because of either Marner or Matthews. It was because of Zach Hyman. The quotes are unacceptable unacceptable I'm, there's no excuse when you get paid 10.893 million dollars per year there is zero excuses and you know probably going back to Johnny, Johnny Gudra for a second it, it is it is that salary and we, we've talked about that the level of expectation for Mario as at the point we talked about it last episode and the exact quote that Alex is talking about this is immediately after the game uh, this is Mitch Marner quote Austin and I the other guys especially come playoff time you want to be the guy they go to and the guy they can uh, that can lead the team out the series we had multiple looks every single game it just seemed like they weren't going in so really no excuse said Marner even though that it kind of sounds like he's making an excuse right there like yeah you had looks but I don't mean to take the crap out of them but Mitch you missed you missed Mitch and you want to talk about looks you had looks to clear the puck in game six 
and you yeeted it over the glass, man. Like, I think there's a mental thing to it as well. I'm just, I'm doing the Gujo thing for mm-hmm. the lols, right? Of course, um, yeah. It's just, there, Mitch Marner, it's just, he has to figure it out. Because, A, they can't trade the contract. You're not going to, uh, and you're not going to just be like, woohoo here, leave him exposed to Seattle and just, they, they'll obviously take him, but then you're all of a sudden losing that caliber of player. For free. Yeah. It is. Yeah. You literally <laughs> have to, have to figure out what is with him mentally because that's what it, he's too talented of a player to let this continue. It, uh, it's just, I don't, I, just, I don't like how he's like, me, Matthews, and the other guys. I'm like, man, it wasn't on the other. It's on you. you it Matthews. is on you. I think, and I don't know. Sense. Like Again, like when he signed that contract, I when he says like, you know, we've had the, we had the, we had the opportunities and everything. I, that, that's, a, right, the, that's the bare minimum. Yes, that is the bare minimum of what is expected of you. I think with him, it's just, if you want to have that, you know, identity as being a star in Toronto, he really has to kind of, he has to show it. And in a way, I kind of feel like maybe that's been bestowed on him way too early. By his, on his own doing though, yeah. that's the point. That's, that's the biggest thing here is the Leafs offered him seven years at $11 million. And he yeah, said, no, he said no, because he thinks he's Matthews. Sorry, you're not. And Matthews wasn't great this series, but Matthews just won the Rocket Richard. He, he, he also, he had Phil Deneau stapled to him. Anytime, you saw how bad the line matching was. Yeah. It was at a point where Montreal didn't consider Mitch a real threat. And Which, we, we even saw that on the power play too. Yeah. And that is the real issue there. Yeah. You can't and, have – sorry, go ahead. Go no, ahead. no, no, no. I, I was just going to say, and we'll get to coaching later, but yeah. the, the inability to put Nylander next to Matthews it, it is kind of inexcusable to me at this point, but mm-hmm. go on with what you were saying. Um, well, beside that, um, I, I wanted to look a little bit deeper into maybe what is next, but I guess before that, um, we can sort of look at – I want to get your guys' take on it. This is how I kind of saw the series kind of unfold, right? It was, I love the saying, and I said this in my video, uh, he who strikes first wins. I think once Montreal game one, won game one, and listen, is that game different with John Tavares playing? Absolutely. But they won that game. And it was never going to be a battle for Montreal. It was going to be the war. And... Ducharme stupidly did not play the young players to start. But once he did and he realized his mistakes, he adapted. And Montreal adapted. And they learned from their mistakes. And I don't feel like Toronto did the same thing. Which is weird to say because it's Ducharme. And I kind of lost like all my faith in this guy in like halfway through the series. But... I mean, and there is a there was a quote when Caulfield was dressed and they asked Sheldon Keefe, and I will admit there is a personal grudge here, asking about what he thought about th- um, sorry what he thought about Cole Caulfield coming into the lineup, and he said it doesn't change anything for us. But then there's a new quote saying once Caught Kinyemi and Caulfield came in, you could see the series shift, and I think there was another quote saying Montreal were getting better and we couldn't adapt to that. That's inexcusable. Like, no offense, but the Habs, I'm insulting my own team here, they had a losing record. They lost more games than they won this year. They were worse than two other teams who did not make the playoffs. This is all for my Bergevin video that I already had, like, and the Habs lost another first game series to the Leafs. Fun fact, every time after game four, I worked on that video during the game day as a, um, as a what do you call it, a... Um, God, what's what's the term that you would use? Um, a prep, like almost like a pregame ritual. I, for, I forget what yeah. you would you would exactly call it, but like voodoo stuff. Okay, I I, I agree. Um, what I kind of felt too is with, you know the Habs were adjusting to what was going on, and I like that point you said, Alex, about 
not changing things around. Like I remember seeing the practice lines, and you know they had Nylander, you know, having a few more runs with Matthews again, where it has worked so well in the past, and to see it not, you know, really unfold during the game, like I, I, I don't know, that was some, that was like a yelling point for me in Game Seven. Like, what are they doing? Like, they have to try something. And I, I saw Keith run uh, Nylander, Matthews, Marner. And and I get it because I guess he's putting Nylander there to kickstart the line in a way, that, that duo in a way. But it's like, no, like, I'm sorry. Let Mitch figure it out with Kerfoot and Galchenyuk. Like, you need to, if there's a guy you need to get going on this team, it is Austin Matthews. It is Austin Matthews and the the... We know the, the combination of Hyman, Matthews, Nylander works. If I go check, I'm very sure Austin Matthews scored 40 goals in his rookie season next to Nylander and Hyman. So we know that that is a combination that works. I don't care if Matthews wants to play with Marner. And to be honest, I couldn't care less if Marner wants to play with Matthews. We're beyond this. We are beyond caring. I, if I'm Sheldon Keefe, I'm beyond caring what these players think at the moment because I want to win. And it's it's just that's it was kind of that would for me was inexcusable to not Again, play that line. Like two things I kind of felt with is like I, I, I agree that, you know, that that Nylander Matthews Hyman line, that's the original first line. It's worked so well for so long. I don't know why they wouldn't want to roll with it again. And I think the second thing too is what you said, like with with Marner wanting to play with Matthews. Like I I don't think that's something that necessarily you 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 could have gone with this whole time when it wasn't working because the way I see it is you know you don't have John Tavares there. Even if these guys were going like they were they were they were hot, I would still put Marner on the second line just to spread around the talent. It's the Edmonton argument. Uh, sorry, Leon and Connor, but eventually you need to divide up and carry your own lines. Mitch, you want eleven million dollars a year? Okay, now prove it. Carry mm-hmm. your own line. Exactly. Um, I want to quickly have a look because the obvious question is 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 what is next, right? So I want to quickly get up Toronto's um, cap friendly and just kind of look at some of the players. First off. Actually, I'll give you guys – Seattle is, is the next big thing in the NHL, right? Yeah. Besides the fact that draft lottery is tomorrow. <laughs> Wait, Alec, that was Adam? a surprise. Yo. You, so you could say Seattle is Brock Lesnar. The next big thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. I just wanted to add that. Sure. Is it a bloody big yeah. deal? Solid. Like yeah. yeah. So – because there's not going to be any big moves that you would think until after the expansion draft, because that's what held stuff out of the trade deadline. Here's the way, and I have the two different layouts. For those of you who don't know, when protecting players to the expansion draft, you have two formats. You can either protect a total of eight skaters and one goaltender or seven forwards, three D and one goalie. So the way I have it myself for Toronto, obviously Tavares, Marner, Matthews, Nylander, Hyman, Kerfoot, and Engvall. Now, when you get to that seventh forward for Toronto, there's not a whole lot of people worth protecting. Maybe because who cares about Engvall? Like, you're not going to protect Spezza because why would you? But like, I don't know, maybe because he's, everyone loves Jason Spezza, but there's just not a lot there. You know what I mean? Like Felino, he's going back to Columbus. Yeah. The defensemen, I have Morgan Riley, TJ Brody, and Jake Muzzin, who missed game seven. He's out three weeks. We forgot to mention that. Um, and then Jack Campbell is the goalie. That would leave the two big names being Travis Dermott and Justin Hall to be available. If you go the eight skaters route, I still have Matthews, Tavares, Marner, Nylander, Hyman, Riley, Muzzin, Brody, Campbell. So then it's still Hall and, and – um, why did I write Sandin? Hall, Dermott – and this would open up a Alex Kerfoot. Now, I think we can all agree Alex Kerfoot was, I thought he was very, very good in that series. Great. He was One of the best yeah. forward. He adapted. You could always, I always noticed him. I, whenever there was like a play, I'm like, yeah, it's Kerfoot again. 
frick off. Stop doing stuff. I'm not a fan of this. Mm-hmm. Um, as I also think of Neilander, I think a part of that was he elevated everyone else. Like that's a great sign for one on Neilander, by the way. Can I just say I never want to hear a bad word about William Neilander and his contract because while the other guys who you they everyone praised, they didn't show up. Like, oh, exactly. Did. I he agree. Did. So, do you go the route of exposing Kerfoot? The reason I say that is because of the flat cap that is not going anywhere. The the Leafs are in this this, this scenario of they're going to have to swap out depth guys with the you know guys like Nick Robertson obviously trying to go into the lineup full time next year to free up some cap space. And what I mean by that is maybe along with money coming off of Frederick Anderson, I'm not saying all of this goes to that single purpose, but maybe you give out a bit more money to a potential 1B goaltender. I don't know who exactly it is, and I'm not doubting Jack Campbell's ability, but we all know how important it is to have a quality second goaltender now. I mean, I agree as well. Like he's gonna be thirty soon, and this is his first time as a starter. So he's that old. Yeah, he's two thousand ten draft. I Goalies cra- are so weird. I have a crazy guy he can go and get. They so can go um, get and like it. <laughs> you know, I actually okay. Before we move on with this, <laughs> yeah. I actually thought just from the tricks, I was really excited about it. I thought David Riddick was gonna be that guy that he was gonna stay. He was gonna do well, and then he was gonna resign and be that like solid backup goalie for Jack Campbell. That was my first thought as well. Yeah. And I would go went to re- read about David Riddick and it's like, okay, maybe not. So I'm just going to quickly list you off of UFAs. You're going to tell me if they're going to be back or not. Dave Riddick. No, no, no. Frederick Anderson. No. no. Oh, that makes me sad. M- Martin Marincin. Probably. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Travis Dermott is Probably man, not. I'd I'd I love know. to have him back, but I I, I don't think he, so. He he's not content with the the minutes, and he would not like to return to this franchise. Travis, oh god, no! Classic NHL yeah. twenty one. <laughs> Justin Boren made a really good point actually that because of the cap situation, is Dermot really going to make that much more money? And maybe you try and see if a Justin Hall gets claimed. Hall, like he has a nice contract, but then you know after this year, it's still two more years, two million dollars. But yeah. uh, Zach Bogosian, I hope so. He was the two of the best defensemen in the playoffs for this team. Yeah, fair One enough. Year, yeah, though, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Joe Thornton. No. Um, Sorry, <laughs> that might have been harsh, but uh, I don't know. It's either it's going to be. I, I for me it's he's not returning. Well, he is going to return, but it it would have to be like a Chara situation where they gave him the ultimatum: either you become a UFA or you retire and accept like a advisory role or something. If it's anywhere, he'll go back to San Jose for some reason for another year. But I, yeah, I don't Marlo see him. Can ride the he's going to go for one more run with the Bruins. No, I don't think they want him. Um, they man, they walked away from Krug and Chara like it was nothing. They don't care about Joe Thornton anymore. Uh, Jason Spatza, I think 100%. we all hope, is yeah, back so. in some way, shape, or form. Uh, Alex Galchenyuk. I could see them bringing him back. Yeah. Um, if it's for similar money that he's making now, I wouldn't mind it. I That's- think yes, and it's yes because it's for his own benefit because he showed that he found stability with this team, and I think the next contract is going to be a one-year show-me one to see what he can do in the top nine. By the way, right now he makes one point oh five million dollars. Uh, Nick Felino, mm, no. no, he's back. He's going. Michael back. Russo, this is the mechanics. Michael situation. Russo mentioned that uh, there was interest for him for Minnesota. So you know, it might not be just Columbus. Him and his brother, Marcus. Yeah, not bad. Um, but yeah, probably probably leaving there. Wayne Simmons. No. No. I don't think so. I'm not gonna lie. I noticed him less and less the longer the series went. He, I wouldn't mind him back if he takes a discount. I I noticed him less and less once he came back from his wrist injury. That's where it went downhill. That's true. Um, if Story I, of his career, uh, great play injuries. Like I, I don't know if he's not 100% healthy. I, I, I don't know. 
if we if he has the off season to rehabilitate his injury and because like that's kind of what the whole Jason Spezza thing was right he was uh, he spent the entire summer in Toronto with the medical with a medical team and apparently learning the penalty kill too but uh, if that's the sim if that's a similar situation with Wayne Simmons I wouldn't necessarily mind it then but I, I don't know what's what's happening. Why does he have a no trade clause? Why is Couldn't that a thing? I don't. By the way, a, if I could go for us, because remember he took a I discount can, with Toronto. Yeah, oh, and and I'm gonna take. I'm gonna gloat for a second here. You picked the wrong team, Lane. Goodbye. Enjoy the golf courses. They're finally opened up in Toronto. Great timing. I stole that from Twitter. I know I did. Yeah, I, know, I, know. I, I have another thing to say about that one too, but um, we'll get to that other player later. So. Riley Nash? No. Who cares? Yes. Did I he know, play? He played, yeah, he played, what, played two games? One, two games. Yeah. Um, and this is the big one. Zach Hyman. I think he will be returning. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I, a lot of people are mentioning um, a lot of speculation, even on The Athletic, where they mentioned that this is probably the year that someone's going to overpay Zach Hyman, but I don't think he's that guy. I think he's someone that he knows his role and – he loves Toronto, so I think they'll they'll do them a solid. He'll he do them is, solid, but he they're not wrong. He's the perfect guy that would get overpaid. Yeah, like if you go back a couple few years ago, where they just handed out contracts. Was that twenty sixteen? Yeah, <laughs> that's a Lucic, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Like Lucic, David Backus. It's just like man, <laughs> it's like guys. He screams five by five. <laughs> He does, yeah. And it's like that back end is going, and he's 28. He's going yeah. to be 29 actually in eight days. Same so, draft as Jack Campbell. It, yeah. He'll be 29 at the start of his next contract. And he will be, if that's five by five per se, he will be 34. Daniel, who are you talking about that player? Which player? With talking about the golf courses. Corey Perry? Oh, no, because, uh, I want to talk about Corey Perry because a lot of the th- stuff that everyone was saying was like Simmons didn't like, he took less money to come to Toronto based on the other offers he had. And what I mentioned on the podcast, social media was what Pierre Lebrun said about Corey Perry and like the 700,000. And a lot of the comments and a lot of like follow-ups to that was just comparing like those two quote unquote, you know, tough guys could get you like the timely goal and comparing their cap hits. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and when they signed, because Perry like waited until training camp. Yeah, it's weird. No one speed like picked him up. I was really confused about that, but I'm not gonna answer again. Um, because he scores in games six and seven, including getting the series winning goal. Oh God, Corey Perry. And I guess we can transition here to the Montreal Canadiens. They won their first playoff series since 2015 against the Ottawa Senators. And uh, yeah, it feels good. It feels so, so good. Um, no one at Sportsnet had them winning, by the way. Oh, even I had goals. That- yes. Okay. I was about to say something about it. I was about to say, you know, the Etu Brutus thing. Remember what? that from uh, Julius Caesar? No. You know, like when he says you two Brutus question mark when no. he's about to get assassinated, Julius Caesar. I don't no, know what no, I know he gets stabbed in like the, the, the like room of governance. Or yeah. And like one of his best friends is Brutus. And I thought of that with Eric Engels when he, I saw him pick the Leafs to beat the Habs. I'm like, really? Eric Engels? No. He was the one who had it going seven, but no, they were all mistaken. In fact, so were Mike, Will Christophilus, Donald, Chase, Harmon Dial. They were all wrong. I don't think he, Harmon gave his. Oh, he did on Twitter. Yeah, he yes, did. Yes. Yeah, he didn't. Not on our show, but no, no. he thought of us on, as Mr. Uh, I, I could, I could speculate. Well, there were some things going exactly. on in Vancouver at the time. <laughs> we understand. He's a busy guy. Yeah, uh, I think he was hoping that he'd be a bit more busier with some firings, but uh, nothing happened in Vancouver. Speaking of potential firings that are not going to happen, Carey Price saves the jobs of Mark Berger and Dominic Ducharme with this series. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. 
when he came down after the game and um, like Carey Price is the last one off the ice, you've really told Carey to go do his interview. Uh, and Mark Bergevin is just, he has this big smile and he's patting him on the back. Like, oh man, that terrible red suit, by the way. What do you like think? Joker. Mark? He did. He has the, the hair for the it. The hair too. as well. Yeah, I was thinking that. And I saw him at the beginning of the game. He would have went full Joker if he had, if they had lost. But luckily, 31's getting retired, right? Like, I saw people talk about how last night was a legacy game for Carey Price. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, like, how do you count this guy out? How do you keep doing it? Like, how do you say, I don't know which Carey Price is going to show up when he's consistently great in the big scenarios? Wait, how do you count out a guy like this with the body of work that he has? Who was counting him out? Did you see all the pre- all the pre-series thingies? Did you guys see? There's a dumb decisions thing about like showing all these like qualities that all the new contenders have. Oh, sorry, all the teams in the second round, and it's like top ten goalie, and it goes to Montreal and says no. It's like, excuse me, like how do you, in good faith? And it's not even like percentage, like all his normal stuff. And like, I'm not making fun of Dom decisions. Like his model is incredible stuff, right? And like, it, like that's what makes the Leafs losing such an upset, right? Is all these things that go in their favor. But how do you in good faith put something out there that shows that Carey Price is not a top 10 goaltender right now? What are you thinking? Since the Haves were facing elimination, Carey Price's save percentage was in the 950s. Yeah, I'm not saying this is accurate. I'm just saying this is an angle people have taken, and it was just the whole injury thing. What do you mean? Just like they're not they're not counting him among like I don't know, like the Andre Vasilevsky or like a Mark Andre Fleury this year because of like the games played. And I think it just you know this. I'm not saying it for Carey Price, but this happens a lot with lists when you know like when we go in the off season and they have a bunch of this like you know top 50 players list but then like garbage a lot of the players are undervalued because they were injured or they just struggled for like one part of something but like it doesn't show the whole picture Mm -hmm. so i think i'm not defending it i'm just saying that sometimes i know those could be skewed and it feels it feels skewed it feels very very much screwed uh anyway your guys' thoughts on Carey Price? Because, again, the difference maker was always going to be Carey. And it was. I mean, there it is. There's Carey Price. He was, um, like, incredible. I, what, I texted you after game six, was it? And I think I, so, think yeah. I said, Carey Price, oh, my God. Uh, game, mm-hmm. same, same with game seven. Actually, I think all the points I texted you, pretty much the same. But um, what... And I don't, we did talk about it a couple, a few episodes ago. What Montreal had to do, just in general, had to do to win, including Carey Price, they did. They literally did the exact things that they had to do to beat the Leafs. They also did a good job, I, I would say, in the later half of the series, Daniels. They did the, the very good job of keeping a lot of shots to the outside which is the Islanders' way to success. So they finally, for the first time, it feels like forever, made his job a lot easier. I think a lot of credit there also goes to Ben Chirot and Shea Weber, who were playing out of their minds. Especially Shea Weber, who is clearly hurt right now. And Ben Chirot, who also stepped got up hurt. huge. Yeah. Yes, it is also definitely injured right now. Yeah. I agree with you. And I think Pierre Lebrun also said that too, just the way Carey Price plays in these presser situations. I think he used one example where he saw me yawning during the gold medal game in Sochi. Yes. And it's like, it's just a guy that he knows what he's doing. And again, like it, it reminded me in a way of that 2014 Carey Price simply because the way it's been to get these goals has been kind of the same way where it hasn't been really high scoring for Montreal, but Carey Price has been able to, kind of hold the fort and at the same time too when you think about those defensive schemes or getting those shots from the outside it's also working as a unit working as to what can work best to support your goalie and make sure you know your defense is is there and they're set at the right time so yeah i don't know like it was frustrating to see it but at the same time like okay as like a toronto fan it's tough to see carrie price play at this level over and over again 
But as a overall hockey fan, it's great to see simply because he is one of the best goalies and you just love watching him in his prime. Exactly, Matt. Oh, I love him. Fun fact, apparently he's the first player to have a cap hit of over $10 million to win a playoff series. I saw that stat and my <laughs> jaw dropped. I first thought it was just goalie, but then I saw, I'm like, oh, wait. Because then you realize, oh, crap, yeah, Kane and Taves never won with their new contracts. No. And then it's like, oh, crap. What's going on? McDavid, yeah, dry side was around like 8.5, but even Sagan was up there, doesn't have one. Listen, the contract is still terrible, but, I mean, how do you figure out $40 million of offense? Have a $10 million goalie. If only Sergey Bobrovsky could play up to that level, that'd be really nice. I remember um, they're like, you know, you need a 10. I think someone wrote this. They're like, you need a ten and a half million dollar goalie to stop $48 million worth of offense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, do you want another word on Corey Perry, by the way? Because in the group chat, you were very much praising him. I, I don't know. I'm really torn about this because remember in the offseason, we had that uh, – we, we, we had that negotiation in where he's probably going to leave Montreal in the offseason, maybe. And when that jersey goes on sale, you're going to get me one and I'll pay you back. But I, I don't so know why. It, I, I don't know. Like, I, I, I made this joke where I said, like, I've been a Corey Payer fan since I was seven years old. And today was the first time that, you know, he actually kind of, you know, he actually hurt me. He actually did, like, like get, get a bit of a dig on me and I never thought that would ever be possible for me being his, like uh, literally a lifetime, f- like a long time fan of his. And I don't know. It's just, it's just, it's just weird because you know, his game, you know how he plays, you know, how timely he can be. And I still think that he's still underestimated in so many ways. You could see on how long he waited on training camp. You could see when the Ducks bought him out. You could see that Dallas didn't want to bring him back, even though, you know, they probably really needed him this year. And that's the thing. It's just like being on that other side of things where it's like, you know, that player you love to hate, but I can't because it came from love the first time. So I just, it's so complicated with me right now with Corey Perry. I hope they bring him back next year. I won't lie. Um, I think there is this, this series alone has carved out a special place in my heart for Corey Perry. And I never thought I would ever say that, but it's, it's happened, man. He's been such a joy to have on the team. You know, who else was really good. Eric Stahl. Yeah. That was surprising. It was, I mean, like he should have gotten a penalty for who did he basically tackle? Dermot? Was it was yeah. it was Dermot or Sandy? Yeah, yeah, like even Eric Engel said, like he saw that, and then the Engvall penalty on Caulfield. I'm like, okay, like if you're gonna call that one, you should have called the other. Yeah, well, you can't you can't bully the baby bear like that. We don't have that here. When that's not allowed to happen. I always forget how much taller Pierre Engvall is than Cole Caulfield. Everyone's taller than Cole Caulfield. <laughs> Just like that compare. Also, like Engvall's like what P- six three, six four. Pierre Engvall's got a neck. Yeah, he's basically <laughs> okay. a giraffe. Uh, right. Okay. Here's the real question: How much money did Phil Deneau make this this this, this playoffs? Seven by <laughs> seven. And I saw that the Canucks are going to play on that. <laughs> Because, man, limiting Matthews to one goal, it's like, you know, everyone's like, yo, Guy Carbono shouldn't have gotten to the Hall of Fame. And everyone was like, guys, look at what he did to Wayne Gretzky. Like, Bob Gainey made his whole career out of that stuff. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of worried that Phil Deneau has kind of just priced himself out of Montreal now. I'm kind of mad about it. But still, oh, Phil, I love him so much. Which is ironic in a way, because remember when we were mentioning his his uh, struggles early in the season and saying like you should have signed that extension. You're losing money by the game. Yeah, I mean it's still games. funny. He's, oh yeah, like he still hasn't. I don't think he had a point, but that wasn't his role, right? Like if they go deeper, like I think if they lose to Winnipeg, then it's like oh okay, well Phil, that's the best you're gonna get here. But I mean so far. Like, he's making them. Like, I'm happy for him. Like, this is what we needed from Phil to know. And, I mean, hey, when they lose Jake Hall in Seattle, there may be some more money there. But, my God, I, I, I love Phil to know. What a great – and him with his pizza was great. Okay, then. 
We couldn't do this because we didn't know who had won yet. So let's quickly just have a nice little look. Winnipeg and Montreal. The series we all thought would happen. I have it in my bracket, so what up? I just want to brag about that, by the way. I don't know who's going to win this. Uh, I was Dom decisions had a kind of breakdown. It was an extremely close series. I think he had, he had it within a, a percentage point. Yeah. How do you see this, this series going down? And without mentioning Hellebuck and Price, because that oh, is too easy. I was going to say, that was like, that was the number one point, my number one point. But uh, mm-hmm. I think it, it'll be an interesting series. But again, I think it's going to come down to how does Montreal s- stop their top six? And the answer is, I'd say the answer is do what you just did. Just keep playing for Montreal. It's keep playing your game. And for Winnipeg, it's okay. What, how do we beat, how do we beat that? How do we watch Toronto and say, okay, this is where Toronto went wrong. And this is what we have to do differently. Cause that's how you're going to be. And, and you said it, right. They limited Toronto to the outside, which believe me, I was screaming at the TV quite a bit. If Munch, if Winnipeg figures out a way to beat that, then that's what you got to do because taking shots from the outside, unless you have someone planted in front of Carey Price, 99.9% of the time is not going to go in. One thing yeah. that we're going to have to watch out for for the Jets is they have a good power play. And, yeah. and Kyle Connor was lighting up Montreal all season. But I, I, I do think, and no, I can't keep us away from the goalies for long is Hellebuck doesn't quite have the same record when it comes to playoffs that Carey Price does. Um, They do have rest now, and I'm not going to say a damn thing about rust because I am being proven wrong at every corner about it. So what I'm going to say is the Jets are perfectly fine, and even if it's only two days of rest, the Habs will be completely rusty and will come out the gate slowly. Even though you have to think they're also – because they're so close to this big game scenario, I would imagine that Montreal at the same time will be more game ready. I'm not saying the Jets are going to come out slow because that's just not going to happen. But I don't think the Habs are going to come out as flat as I saw a lot of people saying. No. But, no. I think this is this is going to be a, a matchup of who can take advantage of what they did best in round one. So I think the Jets, with them, is that it was – kind of a blessing they got Edmonton in the first round because their offense was really struggling and then they just took whatever they could from the Oilers. Um, but I think also with Montreal too is that they've proven that they know how to shut down you know, a top line of stars. And mm-hmm. you're going to have to do that with Winnipeg again where these guys are gaining the momentum again where that first line is finally clicking for the Jets. So it's another, it's another test of whether the Canadians could have that style of play to push them from the outside and just avoid those those skilled shots that they really had on Edmonton. It's also the battle of quality versus quantity once again. It is is um the Jets are bad like do they do have depth obviously. Um the Montreal's own depth is miles ahead of Edmonton's. And the Jets top 6 is still supremely talented as we've just talked about. Um so you're going to see that again. It's it's Montreal strategy here of big burly defense. Let's just play our top four for 40 minutes of the game. Forget the other pairing. You'll have to see it. Poor Romanov, please play. Um, but that's going to be really the look at game one. I believe is on Wednesday. So that will be yeah. also what's really going to suck. That I was thinking about the other day. Now uh, a massive mess in the North Division. The travel. That we're going to go yeah. back and forth from Winnipeg to Montreal yeah. is going to be a pain. And I'm pretty sure there's a back-to-back. I could be wrong. I think there's another one in there. Anyway, though. Find the schedule. They're just rushing yeah. things to get to the draft. I, I, I mean, they're not rushing the get. Like, Vegas and Colorado had two days off. Yeah. What are you doing? What are you absolutely doing? The no- Vancouver ruined everything for everyone. That's mean. It wasn't their fault they got COVID. No, no. No. Oh. Poor, poor Adam Caudet. God, the Canucks suck. Is there any news on Ian Clark yet? I know like Benny was saying we're working on something, but nothing yet? Well, they take no. things day by day, Adam. So. Oh, that they do. That uh, they there do. is a back-to-back Sunday and Monday 
That's June ridiculous, 6th, June man. Seventh. I, I don't really understand Olympics. why. I hate the Olympics. It just messed everything up. But anyway, I don't think there's a reason for the back to back. That's very confusing, but okay. Shall we? We started at six, right? Yes. We have time to look at the other stuff in the dock. Yeah. All right. Oh, wait. Are we going to give a prediction for the series right now? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Sure, if you want. I'm yes. Montreal in six. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Okay. <laughs> and if anyone's wondering, in my bracket, I have them losing to Colorado because I'm that confident Colorado are going to win. And speaking of it, man, did they not just slap around Vegas? Wait, <laughs> final question before that. Who yes. would Patrick Wall go for hypothetically? You would go, man. You'd go for Montreal. Fun fact: the Habs are undefeated since that that all that stuff about Trombley and Wall came out. It changed the timeline. It did. It's <laughs> all those all those cups they lost when Patrick left. It's really interesting that there's apparently a bit when he said he was on his plane to Colorado and he started crying. He never wanted to leave. They just everyone messed up. There is the clash of egos. I'm not they were all young. Patrick. I mean, I don't think he was that young. He was 30 at the time. He was... Exactly. Okay. Anyway, Vegas, Colorado. Yeah. The Vegas made the decision. I don't necessarily disagree with it. To start Robin Leonard in game one. Flurry's a little older. They didn't have a ton of time off. Leonard was proven a very good playoff goalie if you look at his record, actually. He got shelled. And it makes sense because he hadn't played in about 20 days. Um, Vegas did not show up until they were losing like 5-1. Uh, it took Matias Yanmark getting hurt at the same time. And in the ensuing chaos, Ryan Reeves looked like he had his knee on the head of Ryan Graves, who's only through the Yanmark hit. He ends up getting suspension two games for intent to, I think it was roughing slash intent to injure was what he actually got. By the way, fun fact, the, all of this to happen during the game, including a patch already. I think there was a double minor for roughing resulted. I've never said my jaw dropped while I was watching this game. A nine minute. I thought it was the wrong graphic. I, I'd never seen this before. A nine minute power play for Colorado. They only scored once. Then again, it was already like six months. They weren't going to go full horse on it. They should have. But what the hell? First off, and we'll get to Kadri in a second here. Two games was not enough for what he did to Ryan Graves. Absolutely not. He pulled out hair. So when my brother played hockey, he got intent to injure once. And they were trying to get him gone for the whole of the season that was left. Whoa. Yeah. Obviously, I forget what level he played. But that shows the discrepancy that we have here. Intent to injure Player safe, player safety, Players. intent to injure a player. Maybe there should be a little more. However, what a surprise. Only two games. So he'll be back for when they get eliminated in the fourth game anyway. Right. Also, oh my God. Nazem Kadri's suspension is upheld by Gary Bettman. So Kadri will be going to the independent arbitrator. So that's pretty. I mean, I think we're not surprised by that. Anyway, though. Your guys' thoughts on game one beside all the just absolute violence that was in that game? We we said it before. Colorado had to show their dominance yeah. and to prove to prove something, <clears throat> not to, just to the fans, but I think a little bit to themselves in a way, um, that they are the big dogs in the West. And w- when we have that conference back, um, and in game one, they did. Uh, it was seven one. <laughs> like my God, uh, it doesn't get. And you know, I, I have it all up. I have the score uh, with the um, goals. The only one from like their top that wasn't in their top pairing or their top line was Brandon Sod. Like they showed up. Uh, watching that game was depressing for me because they showed up. I'll tell you. Um, I've obviously, I know how much you guys have caught. I've watched every game of Colorado so far. Um, Their power play going into game one was was running 50%. The tic-tac-toe, the puck movement, Kale McCarr. Oh, 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 like, like how quickly they move the puck. McKinnon's goal. 
I don't know how they're going to lose. And they're not getting complacent. That's the problem we saw with, with like Tampa in the past when they lost to Columbus. Colorado are like full foot on the gas here. It's sensational. They are so, so – they're head and shoulders above anyone else right now. I think, um, I think it's like what we talked about before when it came to the obstacles that this team has gone through. And I think they've had those mountains already. Like last year was a huge disappointment for them. So I think, again, it's the majority of the same team coming back. And they want to prove something. They, they've shown through – like literally everything they've done drafting trading you know developing guys it's just all coming together and it just all fits um when it came to the strategic trading with players like devon taves is just it's worked so well and such a good trade for them yeah again like it's just another thing where like they're not letting their foot off the gas because they know what happened in the past few years with this especially the way they have this core right now and what we said with vegas before i think the complacency it was already there. Like, and I'm not saying this is a Minnesota bias, but this was a team you should have beaten in five or six. This is a team that it shouldn't have gone to seven. And I saw that complacency with the Golden Knights where if the top guys were not clicking, like you don't really have like, you know, you don't have a Jason Spezza or you don't have like a Corey Perry or, you know, like even a young player, like you don't have a Jake Evans on that team that could get you a timely goal. When I look at Vegas' bottom six, especially when you have a Matias Janmark go down, like that reduces the depth even more. And I think with the defense as well, where, you know, you had the Chase Theodore, you, you have the Alex Petrangelo, like, but beyond that, like, I don't trust them. Like, I know Alec Martinez is good, but I, he's a complimentary player. He's a guy that I don't think could carry his own line, his, his own pairing. It's funny you mentioned Vegas and you mentioned Evans for a second there. Um, I just want to make this point because Evans took Tatar's spot in the lineup going to game six. I think I know why Vegas never played Thomas Tatar in the playoffs. He is not good in the playoffs. Uh, Nay, it is is not great. Uh, Shout out to Pacioretty for actually scoring for Vegas, by the way. Good for you, Um, Max. Is Cody Glass injured? Well, that's a good question. Because oh, didn't you, he get sent to Henderson for a bit did, or something? You sent me that. I, I saw. I'm gonna search up right now. But because you Daniel mentioned young forward who can score in the bottom six, mm-hmm. and my first thought was Cody Glass. He's played and, one game in the playoffs. Oh my goodness! Four days ago, he. Okay, cool. This website just worked. Um, he was reassigned to the AHL four days ago. What? Are they even playing? No, are they? No, they're not because they're not even in that. I don't know what division Henderson are in because I'm pretty sure it's just the, it's that single division in the AHL playing. But there are no playoff games listed. So, like, first off, why are you assigning him? Because there's no cap in the playoffs or roster limit size. Mm-hmm. I got to Like, we gotta like for next episode. Like, maybe there's a Jesse Granger thing out there. But like, uh, that, yeah, it was really weird. Like, why is Cody Glass just man? You know who? You know who they could really use to help bolster the center depth? Young player. Ma- maybe Nick Suzuki. I oh, knew it. Maybe, yeah, maybe I knew Nick it. Suzuki. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> maybe you should have done the Super Jack Eichel trade I proposed. Uh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Boston. Uh, I'm sorry that we haven't watched any of your games. It's, just, it's the worst times. Uh, but see, Kosis, uh, Kosi, Casey Zizekas scored. Breakaway overtime game winner. That was cool. The series is tied up. I don't know what else to say. I just, we will watch game three. We will. I did see Bruce Cassidy blaming Tuka Rask about reading his angles. I thought, oh, ha. okay. It's Boston's sure. picking it's on Tuka Rask again. Oh, yeah. And Great. that is why he will not re sign with the team. It's one the of summer. the playoff bingos. You know, if we were to have a sheet for that, it's like criticize Tuka Rask. Yeah, I, I don't know. I get what they're doing. I really don't understand. We'll see though, Boston. I hope they lose because forget Boston. See, this I don't is really like both teams. So I, I'm so conflicted. Like, I, I didn't like the Capitals and the Bruins, and then now it's just the Bruins and the Islanders, and it just, you know what I mean? It's really annoying, by the way, that like uh, we don't know exactly 100 percent what the round three matches would be. I'm pretty sure it is guaranteed that it was it's one of the Canadian teams versus one of Colorado and Vegas. Well, no, I guess that just determines it, doesn't it? I'm an idiot. 
So like then, but then you wonder, it's like, man, no offense, but like, do you see Boston? I could see Boston taking out Carolina. I don't think they could beat Tampa. I don't see the Islanders beating Tampa because we saw how that went last year. And like Carolina is still a bit of a wild card. And, you know, um, it was a ferocious game against Tampa Bay in game one, but a late goal the bad goal. get Tampa Bay winning. Uh, it, man, listen, I have seen some weird angles on goalies before. I've never seen one hug the post and have those large of holes in their positioning. That was brutal. Natogovic has been good. But, like, that was really bad. But just like game one against the Panthers, a late one gets Tampa game one. And there's a bit of the experience from Tampa Bay for you. I mean, I'm not surprised. Like, it was a close game. But there's Tampa Bay. They're getting game one. They're looking good. They find their ways. Tampa was on a different level. Exactly. Um, Um, Who's winning game two tonight, by the way? uh, Tampa Bay. Tampa 4-2. Alex, were you going to say something before I asked, by the way? Uh, no, I saw, I see this video going around. Um, someone just posted it of Stephen A. Smith talking about the Leafs, calling him the Dallas Cowboys of the NHL. I'm trying to find the full video. Oh, that's why uh, I, saw, I had a friend go. that sent me that today. It, it's I'm, like I'm, the, just the Cowboys reference. I didn't get it. Yeah, I'm trying to find the full video before we end the episode but I'm having lots of trouble right now. So that's what I was going to say. Shout out to Robin Mercurio. If you're listening, I know you're a listener of the show. Who is that? Uh, it's my friend that mentioned to me, uh, the whole uh, Dallas Cowboys are the Leafs of the NFL. Oh, well, I mean, I know the, I think the Cowboys are bad, right? They're like big spenders I, I as well. Know. They're like, they're big spenders, but they underperform in the playoffs. Mike really likes watching uh, underperforming teams, doesn't he? I'm pretty sure he's a Cowboys <laughs> fan, too. <laughs> I don't think he's rejoined the group chat, by the way. I don't think no. so. So we're in two group chats. There are just the two, three of us. <sighs> we're in, wait, what's, we're in there's several. The, there's the Twitter one that we don't really use a ton. And there's the Instagram one. There's the, te- there's the iMessage one. There's the one that sometimes with Mike, but I feel like Daniel has it on Do Not Disturb because of the shenanigans that go in there. Sometimes, no, I just check my phone. I'm like, why are there 50 messages? And it's like from the fair, one chat. Fair, very fair. <laughs> um, yeah. So this we also have the self awareness podcast one. Yeah, yeah, that that one. So weird. And the podcast messages us. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. So this is how Mike. You. <laughs> this is why Mike's not joining, rejoining the group chat right now. Uh, last night I texted him, like. Midway through the third, I had taken off my jersey. I'm like, I just I can't wear this. And then he texts me back. He's like, Yeah, I threw it in my pool. He's like, I'm not taking it. <laughs> I go. Well. He, he he then. It's now become a tradition when they lose in the playoffs that Mike FaceTimes me. We talked for about five ten minutes, which was. I'm like, man, I wish it was a little bit longer. But he's we neither of us had anything to say at that point. It's like, yeah, I'm why gonna take you- a. What? Why didn't you watch party all the games? Uh, well, he said he was watching with other people. I'm like, okay, I'm, I put, I set something I up it. outside, yeah. and then uh, I I watched outside, and and then he's like, yeah, I'm not taking it out until tomorrow morning. I said that's fair. There I were guess. a few times I wanted to message you guys saying, so are we back to doing these again when the Leafs beat Montreal? <laughs> I, and then Montreal won. Right? Yeah, it's that was pretty cool. I get to keep my playoff beard now. Yeah. Looks good. It looks good. Thanks. You're thanks. Keep, You're the only two two people saying that it is. Does, thankfully, so does your not, mom not like it? I don't think my mom's even noticed that. Oh, uh-huh. I didn't even like realize that I had started growing it. And then like I was looking at myself in the mirror. I'm like, oh yeah, I haven't shaved. I'm like, well, the playoffs have started. I can't shave it. Exactly. exactly. So you can. Timo Solani always did. He never had a beard. Yeah, and yeah. guess what? He only won like one cup. They still won. Yeah, but only one. Wah won four. Uh, you're gonna come. Okay, you, you're gonna use that argument like crazy. Eiserman <laughs> had how many did Eiserman have? Steve, he has three. Well, three as a player. I don't know, yeah, it's weird that he. I hope Tampa gave him like a, no, he wouldn't want the ring, but like he basically built that team. Okay. Um, that's everything. 
It's so weird, by the way, after the first round, like how we had the dock organized. And now you're realizing, oh, there's only four series now. <laughs> yeah. It feels like such a drop off. And you're like, you're wanting three games a night. Now you're down to like one tonight, two tomorrow. Two. And you're like, God, it just no, this sucks. Oh. It's even worse. Like last year, there was the play in and there were like four marathon games. And even the first round fell tactic. And you get to the second, you're like, man, what's the point now? Yeah. Like, and there were no fans, and it was like <laughs> empty and garbage. And it's like, what is this? Um, <sighs> before we go, yeah. I forgot to mention my Mitch Marner hot take. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I said this last night, and no one disagreed with me, but that could be the emotions. I am of the belief that with this generation of Leaf players, Mitch Marner will be the most hated. Oh. I'm trying to like gauge where like that might be true. Just I think it's just on on heated emotions right now that we have in the last 48 hours, 24, 48 hours. Because I'm trying to think of other people on that list that like to just like you know know the meter. Well, William Nylander was number one for uh, yeah. The last how many years? Uh, I remember for a while Curtis Joseph was on that list. No, but I'm saying was this he? generation. Oh, this generation. This generation. By this apologies. generation um, players. It's amazing he's going to be Jake Gardner. Yeah, I think he's going to be worse than Jake Gardner. It's Patrick it's Marlowe. Really... No, no, no. Because of the draft no. pick. No. Yeah. No. Who that cares? Was, that was the good. mistake. Everyone knew that was a mistake. At okay. The time. Um, it's but, really funny, by the way, Mike. Like for some reason, I'm doing the Twitter check, right? And Mike, like, you know, quote tweets the stuff yesterday saying showtime. And Riley Fussell just <laughs> replies saw. 30 minutes ago saying, yeah. lol. I saw that. I saw that. That's funny. <laughs> Tyson Berry? No. Oh. No, no. I'm, no. I'm telling you it's Mitch Marner. The hometown kid pushed it to the limits with, with Dubis. And even at the time, people didn't like it. And he didn't show up two years Man. in a row. And William Nylander did. And so nothing. not Phil Kessel. No, I think I think after he left, a lot of people like Phil Kessel. Okay. <laughs> Phil love people love Phil for the memes. No, man, I, that guy he was a hell of a player for Toronto. Yeah. I will stand by that argument any day. Scored a lot of goals. Yeah, okay, you know, I actually like you're right. I actually can't think of anybody else now. That's the only people I'm thinking of. Like maybe Garrett Sparks, but he made seven hundred thousand I mean, dollars. Yeah, seven players. Yeah, well. I'm sure there's a few coaches in there where you're like, oh man, Peter Horacek. Yeah. Babs at the end of it, probably. Um, I think David like, Clarkson redeemed himself by being traded twice to Toronto. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think his dead cap hit pretty much helped. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's my Leafs hot take. Well, that's, Mitch that's, hot take. The Columbus Blue Jackets not insuring a contract revived David Clarkson's legacy <laughs> in Toronto. Crazy how sports work. Okay, I think that's everything. That is everything for me. Damn, what an emotional day. Say. What an emotional time right now to be recording i'll tell you i woke up yesterday for game seven and i was so anxious like there is nothing there was i couldn't do anything still can't so you know what you know what this made me realize the real playoffs are the friends you made along the way yeah what friends cool. did we make along the way i think we just kept yeah, the ones we, we already had okay. yeah <laughs> which is, which is i guess a Listen. positive this is what I've gained. The Habs could get swept by the Leafs next year, like in the regular season. And I could care less because now I have the bragging rights. Yeah, that's fair. Boy said, thank you as always for being a great platform for the show. No, a fantastic one. Check out my YouTube channel, Reaction from Game 7. That was pretty fun. Um, Alex's blog, Daniel Suffer the Hockey Riders. He's getting ready for the offseason. It's going to be a good one. From Minnesota, you get excited for the draft lottery because this is the this is the last one that's a chance where like it can go completely balls to the walls and like the lottery can be completely messed up and like a fifteenth place team can win. So I can't wait for New York to win another lottery. That'll be fun. Uh, check out all the show socials, the YouTube, the TikTok. Uh, I think that's it. I don't know. Bye. Facebook. Facebook. Yes. Do you say TikTok? I did say TikTok. Yes. TikTok. Instagram. Yeah. Twitter. Everything. Especially Facebook, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Our own socials as well. Yeah. I think that's everything. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Shout out to Will and Laura. You guys are great. No Will Baldwin. Yeah, Will Baldwin. Will Baldwin. Got to clarify. Yeah.